So we will move to the next uh, speaker. So the next speaker was uh, uh, actually a speaker last year to the WISE workshop. So good uh, afternoon, Lina. Welcome back. So um, yeah, last year you gave a great um, talk and uh, kind of a workshop uh, environment. I hope this year we'll have the same uh, uh, experience. So um, Lina is going to talk about personal branding and uh, um, when you are ready, you can share your screen and we can start. Sure, that's wonderful. Uh, is it possible that I can see the people in the audience? I will ask that. Can you show? Yes, it's possible. Okay, that would but be. But we are great. in the dark. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no worries. So long, I, I, if I, as I could see some uh, heads and faces. Okay, fantastic. Sorry. Wonderful. So, um, sorry, I will start sharing. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, wonderful. So thank you again for having me this year. Last year, indeed, I was a, a speaker in this event and I was um, very happy to have been invited. I am super happy to be here again for another year. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Lina Dao Uru. Um, I'm an associate professor of organizational behavior at the Olayan School of Business. And you can see our business school here behind me. Uh, I'm also a research affiliate at the Center for Inclusive Business and Leadership for Women, uh, Sybil W. Uh, and I'm a Women in Data Science co-ambassador. And uh, yesterday we actually had our Women in Data Science conference as well. Um, physically, I am based in Helsinki uh, and I'm a visiting researcher at Alt University. So uh, bringing a bit of uh, to the front words. So first, before we start, I wanted to wish every one of you here a very happy Women's Day. Um, I really like this picture because it kind of like um, summarizes, shows a lot of strength while at the same time summarizing a lot of the, the taboos and the social concepts that kind of like weigh in heavy on us as women, wherever we are around the world. And I totally agree with uh, the previous speaker. Sorry, I missed her talk. Uh, I think I missed something really wonderful. Uh, I came at the, at the very end. Um, so in a nutshell, um, the reason why I'm giving this talk today and the reason why I do give similar talks about women and women in STEM in particular um, is because I am an engaged scholar. I'm a scholar activist, if, if I can use these two terms as the parallels. I care about many things. One of them, one major thing is fairness, women's rights, uh, meritocracy, uh, cultural sensitivity. I care about bridging between the theory and practice. But the issue of women is not something that I a study all the time or like it's part of the research that I do but it's not all the research that I do but being a woman is uh, um, something that I do every single day and doing gender work or doing gender like we are today in this uh, uh, in the session is something very dear to my heart because I truly believe the more we do things like this the more we are able to actually change the status quo so uh, as um uh, was said earlier, I will actually be uh, engaging with you. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not keeping the Q&A until the very end. I do have few polls and few questions that I would like to engage with you in. But I'm going to start with you with the problem that I'm coming here to address today. And I found yesterday as part of this year's uh, um, Women's International Women's Day campaign, I found a very interesting uh, uh, campaign by, uh, that, that I thought was, timely and kind of like summarizes the problem that we have. I'm going to start showing you one by one. Just got back from the doctor. What did he say? She. I ran into the new CEO. What's he like? She. My old boss is here. Where is he? She. We need to meet with the accountant. When is he free? She. I heard back from my professor. What was his feedback? She, her feedback. So the issue of uh, uh, women and the assumption of like jobs belonging to different genders is not something that happens uh, only in parts of the world. It happens actually everywhere around the world. And this is a picture 
of uh, the, the leaders of the five major political parties in Finland, Finland where I am now, with the lady in the middle, who is a 35-year-old uh, uh, lady. He, she is the prime minister currently of Finland. And the reason why I wanted to put this picture here for you is that even in the places where gender parity has been achieved or is at its best, we st still do as women have problems and we have not achieved equality in the sense of environments that are fully inclusive, environments that respect our differences and that where we are able to be who we are and exist as the people who we are in those environments. Even in places such as Finland and other Scandinavian countries that often rank quite high on um, uh, gender parity, we still find that, they, that women still struggle and still face issues at work. So let's look at uh, some data. Um, if we look at uh, you know, global data in terms of uh, uh, women employability, we notice that women and men are not equally employable. And this is the big picture around the world. If we combine all the data together. So the workplace or the workforce today, 75% representation by men, 48.7% representation by women. The problem is this gap, first of all, exists between the two genders and it's quite significant, but also um, in general, the more people contribute economically and are active uh, uh, parts of the society, the more the society can actually thrive. But that doesn't mean that everyone should work and must work, you know, because, and work, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a contract uh, uh, with an employer because work also sometimes could be you know, being at home, being with the kids, as uh, the previous speaker was talking. And we'll tackle this point in a little bit. So I'm going to just give you a few statistics and a few, a few facts that were uh, provided, you know, that, that we know about uh, um, the gender issue and the gender gap. Narrowing the gender gap is not only a moral issue. It's not like we want equality and that's it. It's not equality for the sake of equality. It's actually a moral issue, yes, but it's also a social, a legal, a political, and an economic issue. And unfortunately, we do have to sometimes stress on this and, I, and really flesh out the economic or the business case for narrowing the gender gap because many people in a capitalistic world understand better when they understand the impact on, uh, uh, on the financials. So, Studies by or global reports from McKinsey, uh, from ILO, from OECD, World Economic Forum and the UN Women have shown that if we narrow the gender gap at work and in society, we could increase global GDP by 12 trillion dollars by 2025. So it is not a joke. The impact is not only on one country or the other. The impact will be on the global GDP as a whole. But if we look at the current rates of progress and we look at gen gender parity and how it can be reached, we know that, you know, the data or the estimates show that gender parity can be reached in uh, 61 years in Western Europe, which is still quite a long time, but 61 years, 62 years in Southeast Asia, and 157 years in the Middle East. We are lagging way behind and there's no better time for us in this part of the world to be taking action and to be doing all the work that we're doing in order to change the status quo. And this is data from the World Bank from 2017, by the way. So 2017 till now, so 157, hopefully we've come a little bit closer and it's like 153 <laughs> at the moment. So let's see, what are the barriers? And I'm gonna turn the floor to you very soon. So um, some of the barriers are legislative barriers. Um, if I, I would like to invite you to look at this top column here, which is um, the MENA region, and then compare it to the OECD high income countries. Okay, so first, here are the percentage of economies which restrict women's employment by type of restriction. The first type of restriction is certain jobs deemed hazardous, uh, or arduous or morally inappropriate for women to engage in. And I'm going to show you an example from the Lebanese uh, uh, code of conduct, like the employment law. So in the MENA region, that's, the number is quite high and uh, the OECD is, becomes much less. If you look at, 
restrictions because of industry specific restrictions for example women cannot work in mining or construction etc the number is still quite high if you look at restrictions on working during night hours also restrictions are quite high the reason why i wanted you to compare with high oecd high income countries is because you know, uh, uh, these are countries that are considered to be developed uh, countries, countries that have uh, high income, that have strong economies. And these, it's, these differences really uh, are stark differences that help us understand a little bit why we are lagging behind as well. Here's an example from the Lebanese Code of Conduct. Before that, there's actually a clause that says um, it is not allowed to discriminate against women in any shape or form in Lebanon. And right under it, under it, it says women are, are allowed to work only, uh, are not allowed to work in the um, industries listed in this annex number one. And if you look at the annex number one, things like oven work for melting, refining, and firing the mineral of mineral products, silvering mirrors by the uh, quick silver process glass melting and firing, production of alcohol and all other alcoholic drinks, even though Lebanon, we do have alcohol production and alcoholic drinks, uh, some sort of painting, mixing and pasting operations, repairing and cleaning driving engines on the run, asphalt production. You know, it's just surprising to see that we have all this list that has not been changed since this uh, code of conduct, this, uh, um, Labor code, or code was even drafted for the first time. But legal barriers are not the only ones. And I would like to turn the floor to you to hear out from you. What other challenges or barriers have you experienced or have you witnessed or know of that are hindering women from pursuing or remaining in their careers in STEM? I have a jam board, but let me see the number of attendees online. The, well, the participants online can also also raise their hands, or we can hear out from uh, people in the in the audience. I will fill the gap a little bit here. So, some of the barriers are barriers that are that have to do with the law. The law not allowing me to work in this the industry or in that industry. Fair enough. What other barriers exist, particularly relating to uh, careers in STEM? in your opinion. We have someone here. Um, uh, specifically speaking for Saudi Arabia, I've noticed growing up that um, barriers, uh, a lot of barriers usually center around um, social barriers and career opportunities. So I was initially discouraged from pursuing a career in STEM just because who's gonna hire a Saudi woman, that there aren't jobs in Saudi for Saudi women in STEM and in other countries, they're not going to hire me over somebody from their own country. You know? That's great. Thank you for sharing this with us. And it's a, yeah, I'm so glad to hear that you did end up pursuing a career and look how many jobs are available now in Saudi Arabia and outside for women in STEM. And in fact, we need more of these jobs and more developed, you know, developed countries are investing and they need more people in STEM because STEM is the future and, and this is where you make uh, um, more money and interventions and innovations at the national level and you need more people to be part of this uh, um, part of the STEM field altogether and the more you have you know the less you have people in STEM you're losing on big samples of people you know uh, um, from your from your available uh, the, from the available people, you're losing so much talent that could potentially be harnessing or channeling their, their energy in the right direction. I'm glad to hear that you said the word social because I, I like it much better than the word cultural because it's not necessarily cultural issues, it's, it's socialization for sure. Anyone else? I will wait and give you your time. Yes. Just to take a bit of time because we need to move the microphone around. Sure. Problem is that I cannot see. So you'll have to tell me if there's someone who has their hand because the, the yes, camera. Yes, I will. I will. Okay. Hello. Um, well, one challenge that oh. I've witnessed in among my friends, and I also lived it, was that after having a child, 
Um, we, when we decide to stay at home for one year during the first year or two years when they're born, it's a struggle going back, going back to work. And it's actually frowned upon when we do make that decision to leave our jobs, to stay at home with our children. We, there's a lot of opposition. Are you sure? Look, there's daycares, there's nannies, there's, are you sure you want to stay with your child? And when we do make that decision, then going back is, why, why is there a gap in your CV? What happened? And it, that, that's a challenge for remaining in STEM. Absolutely. And actually, I would like to go to another part of my slide. I'll come back to this, but um, since you're mentioning this, there's something I would like to go and show you. Sorry for moving very quickly. Here. Have you come across this campaign, by the way? This is a campaign by Mom Life. Um, and it actually portrays uh, uh, something from reality that kind of reflects on our role in society and the gender roles that have been imposed in society and that come to create a barrier in our lives. One of them, for example, these two parents with their kids in the supermarket, the father is the super helpful, super amazing, and the mother is just the mother doing her duty. Here's another one. The father is the attentive father, whereas the mother is the inattentive mother because she's on her phone instead of being there taking care of the kids. Whereas the father, oh, bless him, he took the kids and he's still doing his work while he's taking care of the kids. The father reading a book, oh, the father is babysitting, whereas the mother is actually parenting because it's her duty to, to, uh, to educate. And I really like this because I hear it also in my, in my life. And my mother, for example, always telling me like, oh, it's amazing that your husband helps you so much with the kids. I'm like, yeah, but it, no, my husband doesn't help me with the kids. He plays his role as a father with his own kids. He wants to be there and play the father figure. And we have so much of these um, of these obstacles that are social obstacles that come in the way and actually make our reality very difficult. You go back to work and look at the guilt that you carry with you. Oh, I'm sitting here at work instead of being with my, uh, with my kids at home. And if you don't think about it, other people might come and implant this idea in your head as well. Anyone else would like to add? We have someone in the room. Okay. Hi, Lena. Thank you for your uh, very informative presentation. Um, really, uh, it's also uh, very, um, I mean, the images that you presented are very realistic. One of the things that, I mean, from my point of view is that um, the equal pay situation. And I know it's probably, uh, I don't know if it's an issue that would hinder women, um, but it would definitely depress women and, and feel like it would negate from their um, self-worth. And okay, I'm doing the same job. Maybe I'm working longer hours, but I'm getting paid less. And, and this was a conversation that we had once, uh, you know, with a few policymakers and decision makers, and they were surprised to know that in Saudi Arabia, by law, we, we pay, or we're supposed to pay, equal pay. Now, how, the, how do you recognize um, equal work and equal pay? Because there could be very clever loopholes to get out of paying women equal pay. Say, so, okay, yes, they have the same qualification, but she's not working on the same kind of projects. Or, you know, uh, to say, to justify why they're giving men a higher salary. Um, I had a guy come into my office and say, bravo, you've hired a lot of women. You must be saving a lot of money. And I said, "Are you? excuse me, I'm a woman. Uh, can't you tell? Do you think I'm going to exploit women to save money? Of course I'm paying them equally, you know. And he was surprised. He says, oh, I thought you were a businesswoman. And I said to him, I'm a human being that is fair. I'm a fair person. I'm a fair employer. So this cutthroat idea of how to save money, some people will hire women so they can pay less salaries. Yeah. So, and some people will hire women because it's, it's beneficial to have them in the workplace because of the public image. Anyway. 
you, 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 it's extremely important what you're saying here. What you're saying is that people perceive uh, also, okay, there is uh, non-equal pay, unfortunately, for the same job. And some people argue there's a lot that has, that has been theorized around the idea of negotiation and women and their ability to negotiate. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But I want to go back to this idea of like, you know, um, not hiring, like hiring women will either is like you're saving money all great because you pay them less or don't hire women because, you know, the, ne next she will need to... Um, you know, uh, have a baby and uh, take a maternity leave and all of this is that we'll have to replace her during that time and uh, all of this is costly. Unfortunately, the problem with all with this mentality is that very it's very short term oriented. So in, in the short term, yes, you might be paying and you need the coverage and you need someone to come and um, take the, to replace that person uh, when they are uh, when they are away however if you think about it in the long run and and, and in a long term mentality in fact there is much more benefit to have women hired as a societal level at the national level and at the organizational level for your image, for economic contribution and for many other purposes, rather than go the easy way. Oh, no, let's uh, go for the man who has the same qualifications as the woman, but just because he's not going to be pregnant in the next uh, you know, year or two. And unfortunately, we allow that through our systems. We have systems of hiring, systems of promotion, systems of um, recruitment and retention and promotion that are not built with the idea or the mentality of inclusion and ensuring uh, fairness and fair treatment. If we start from that perspective, it could help us break all of these barriers and try to start creating a more inclusive environment for women that would that would you know, uh, want them to, to, to stay and they want to remain in, actually. Is there anyone else who would like to add anything before I move on? Uh, yes, I just have something to say. Yes, there is some... I can hear you. It's a little bit far. Hello. Hi. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, well, thank you for this discussion. Um, I think it's very important to talk about uh, things like this. But I think what I have to say is that it's not only for the women in STEM. I think this also applies to women in every every field, uh, especially in fields where um, ma like males are still dominating, right? Um, but I think definitely I see I'm like at an age where I'm thinking about the next step of my career, but also um, like thinking about whether I want to have a family or not. And I think for women, unfortunately, we have that pressure where it comes in like, oh, do I, should I choose my career or having a family, right? And I understand that you can have both, but realistically speaking, you also need to have a very supportive partner, right? To be able to have both. So I think that's something that's very tricky for females that could like hinder them from pursuing a career uh, in any field. Um, and also the fact that like leadership positions or um, like faculty positions are mostly still dominated by males or there's the, it feels like there's this male or bro club <laughs> um, where they all um, bond and um, like mentor each other. And sometimes it's very hard to break through um, these social clubs. So yeah, I think that's, so those, these are some of the few things that could um, hinder women from pursuing um, any leadership role. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. That's extremely insightful, actually. Um, one thing that you said about the support of husband, it is uh, extremely important. So my first advice on that front would be, please choose wisely, <laughs> because these men exist. But then the other thing is that, unfortunately, the way we are raising men, the way we are uh, uh, creating gender roles that distinguish between what a man and what a woman, what is okay for a man to do and what is okay for a woman to do, is actually harming our society. We end up having uh, uh, raising kids in a, in a household where the husband is not present, where the father figure is non-existent almost. Uh, in the life of the of the child and this becomes dangerous this becomes dangerous because every one of us need a mother and a father and the mother and the father give two different things in the in the life of the child 
But unfortunately, there's something that we need to there's something that we need to start doing from the uh, the minute we start raising our kids to until they start thinking about their future partners, who they want to be with, because we need to normalize it. We need to normalize being a fatherhood, simply. Normalize fatherhood, that's the new hashtag. <laughs> um, another thing that you said that was extremely important was um, the fact that there are lots of, you know, uh, um, men's club and uh, top level positions being occupied by men in general. While many men are extremely supportive uh, of women and they are feminists in the way they behave and act, etc. This is not the majority, unfortunately. It is a, a fraction or a certain percentage of, uh, of men. But the problem is that this creates a, a lacune, a gap in role models for women. If you don't see something, it becomes more difficult for you to imagine it. If you don't see that it is possible to be successful and to be a top leader and to have a family and to do all of that, it becomes very difficult for you to do it. So if, um, if for example, you know, that's why events like this one where you, I, I'm not a scientist, I'm a social scientist, not a, a natural scientist, but events like this where uh, we bring in speakers, women, for example, in the Women in uh, Data Science event like, that we hold every year, or even in, in events like this where we bring in leading women in STEM fields to come and talk to others. The critical role that these events play is that they, they put forward those role models that you can be, you exist, these people exist. And that starts helping us to break those barriers and break this uh, um, idea that in our head is, is non-existent because we cannot see it. And we need to do more of these things so that we could start moving and pushing the agenda of the uh, you know, women on the, on the table and make sure that our representation in the workplace becomes even uh, higher and higher. So let's talk about few realities facing women. Why do so many women uh, leave STEM? I did a bit of search and I found, uh, look, this is um, an interesting one. This is the tech world. Um, if you look at the numbers, these are a percentage of female employees in the workforce of major tech companies. Um, the total workforce is the lightest uh, color and then leadership positions are um, uh, this dark, is a dark purple and the pink is the tech jobs in particular. So what is this telling us? First of all, we notice that even though the number of women, for example, at PayPal, you have 44% of the workforce is female, how many of these women are actually in tech jobs? It's half of that. So women end up being or joining positions and careers that are more considered soft, if I may say. And by soft, we mean like HR, administration, legal, etc. And, you know, this has been, it's part of the socialization as well. And part of like when you're at home and wanting to go to university, et cetera, you are pushed towards other fields than the, than the hard fields as a woman because it's, they're more suited for females in general. And then you end up having like, you know, companies, tech companies like this who are ticking the boxes sometimes. And look, we have a high number of female employed in our organization, but in reality, the percentage is actually small uh, if we think about tech jobs in particular. And also in leadership positions, uh, the numbers are not, uh, are not incredible. And this is some of the best case scenarios, what you have in front of you here. These are really the biggest companies, the Googles, the Microsoft, the Apple, Facebook, or uh, Meta, we can we call it now, and uh, Twitter and Amazon and eBay and PayPal. These are the big tech giants of the world. Um, women in science still face gender bias. And if you look at the numbers, in, uh, because many people argue that, you know, we need to educate more women in the STEM field so that we can have them more represented in the workplace. The numbers are still very low. We have 28% of women in engineer, engineering graduates, 40% in computer science, 33% of all researchers are women. So the, the numbers are still very low. But we are seeing an increase and an improvement. And, and in parts of the world, for example, in, um, in the MENA region, you notice that the um, level of education is becoming higher and higher by the day. 
And for example, at AUB, the number of graduates as a whole from the American University of Beirut is approximately 50-50. And that percentage is not very far from other universities. But the problem is that if you go to the workplace, what is the percentage representation of women in the workplace? Even if the number of women graduating from universities is in the 50%, representation is in the workplace goes down to around the 20%. Labor for, uh, force representation ranges, it's actually among the lowest in the, uh, in the Arab world, and it ranges between 14% and 44%. Lebanon is a place where we uh, consider that women are more empowered, etc. Actually, we have terrible gender equity, and we have very low representation of women in the workplace, and that's approximately at the 23%. Some of the arguments for that is that uh, women, for example, don't end up going into the workplace because as you are applying, you get hit by the wall of, uh, oh, she's uh, 25, and next she will and engaged. In two years, she's going to be married and she's going to have a kid and she's going to take time off and that's not going to be good for my, um, for my organization. But another reason is that also women are encouraged to take a, you know, get a university degree to have better options for a husband in the future, as opposed to better careers. If anyone would like to add anything, you can always raise your hand and we could, you know, um, we could talk about it. The Arab media has a very low percentage of women in leadership position at the rate of 11% compared to 27% globally. And that's ILO 2019. This is a very alarming number. 11% decision makers. 27% globally is the, you know, um, women representation at board level and at the sea level. Why? Why? And look at the world that we are in today. It's not that, you know, um, it, it's a, a beautiful world that we live in. Wars are everywhere. Inequality, discrimination, um, environmental crises, uh, cyber attacks. There's no care. And, and this COVID-19 experience that we went through showed us that we are very far away from a care economy and care jobs are the least appreciated in, uh, um, economically speaking, but they are the most needed when it comes to uh, a crisis and global crisis particularly. And of these 11% in leadership position, look at the percentage of the board of directors, 2% female representation in, board, uh, in the boards in the MENA region. This is a number that we need to change. We will not allow this number to continue. Not because we just want equality, because we believe in diversity and we believe that women will bring in other perspectives that men don't have or see differently. It's diversity as a whole that will make the difference at the end of the day. Going back to the comment about, um, you know, lack of uh, role models. Comment. Yes. Sorry, Lina, we have a, a comment or a question from the... Yes, audience. please, anytime. Please interrupt me because I cannot see very well. Hi, Lena. It's me again, Nadia Bakhurji. Um, Hi, I Nadia. I love your uh, presence. Yeah, it, to, listening to you is reminding me of many things. Um, one of them is uh, women at board level tend to experience something called uh, separate and isolate. And if she's part of a board and uh, the board is predominantly male, what they do is they, and it's not really, I've experienced this because I've, I've sat on different boards. And when I, when I first got on the board of the Saudi Council of Engineers, um, my first uh, uh, term with them, I didn't have this experience. I was just so happy to be there and I wanted to support and I was there for legitimate reasons and I was elected. I wasn't put there because of a quota. Um, and I felt that they patronized me somewhat to start off with. And then there was all the lobbying going on outside the boardroom. You know, when you talk about the men's club, even Zaha Hadid, uh, she talks about that in one of her interviews. She's a famous architect. Mm -hmm. And she said that mm -hmm. there were big projects she didn't get because she wasn't invited to the golf club. And she wasn't part of that narrative, the, the conversation. And if you're on a board, at, on a board level, and you find yourself uh, surprised in a meeting because they've been lobbying outside um, to 
put to shelve a project that you've been working on for a year to advance and empower women. And suddenly that all that strategy disappears and you don't know where it is uh, and you're like stuck in limbo um, because you know, you're unaware of the lobbying and you're unaware that the men are actually grouping together. Now, I hope that's less and less in, as, we, as we progress. And that's why it's important to see more women at board level in leadership positions, but they also need to be coached. I think coaching and mentoring is really important because you may be amazing and you may be able to trailblaze all the way to the top on the merit of your amazing work. And you may have colleagues that are uh, supporting and, and applauding you. But the, the truth is that if you're not coached and mentored to know how to deal with the, the, the not only the commitments and the responsibilities, those are probably things that will come to you naturally, but how to cope with the uh, adversity the almost the um, sabotaging of your work and your time. So uh, coaching is important, that's one point. The other point, I want to go back to one of your slides where you talked about women uh, leaving the workplace and the percentages of them leaving STEM. Um, there was a study done by Brighton University about women leaving architecture. So women could study architecture and be amazing architects, but um, a, a, a high percentage of women leave, leave the profession. And why is that? Because of the long hours, the, the harsh working uh, environment, the, you know, it's very anti-family, anti-social, anti-raising kids. And the other thing is that the, one of the speakers, one of the ladies commented on how when she, had to, when she left work, it was difficult for her to come back. The problem with, te with technology and STEM and architecture and anything to do with engineering and technology in our day to day is, is moving very quickly. So there's new advancements in this, in this field. And if you leave, if you just leave the cycle for even six months, let's say a year, okay? Like, I know women who've left for like 10 years and they want to come back. They find themselves lost. Very difficult. Because it's a... Yes, it's very difficult. There's like the technology's moved on, the know-how's moved on, and, and they give up because it's very difficult. So um, so that's why I, I, you know, I encourage and would encourage employers to try and keep ladies engaged as long as possible if she chooses to be. Um, I think those yeah. were the two main points I wanted to make. Right. Thank you, Nadia. This is really, really interesting. Um, I want to go back to the uh, issue of coaching women. While I do agree that coaching is necessary to a certain degree, uh, particularly in order, as you rightly said, that, uh, it's to be prepared for the adversity and to fight back and to push back because there, there needs to be a lot of pushing back. What I believe is the problem is not the women lacking the skills uh, uh, necessarily, but what I believe is that the, the cultures that have been created are toxic. And these cultures are what need to be changed. I remember very well once uh, our president actually said, uh, when he was commenting, commenting uh, our uh, president of Lebanon, when he was commenting on the lack of representation of women in uh, politics, he said that, uh, yes, I'm going to say it in Arabic and then I'll translate it. That the women, uh, woman is not um, well versed in the political life. When the thing is, there are trainings and things that they're doing now, but I don't think it's the trainings that are needed. I think it's the political life altogether that needs to be changed and flipped upside down and, and, and to adopt female values or values that are more appreciated by women in general uh, in order for it to be fixed. And we are a great example of, uh, of that uh, uh, toxic uh, masculinity where it led to actually in the political life in Lebanon. So yes, coaching is necessary. Um, but then also a change of the cultures is even more important and the mindset and the attitudes of the men who exist also on the boards and outside. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's always this issue of quota. Uh, whenever we talk about women in politics, whenever we talk about women in organizations and how can we push the agenda, uh, there's a lot of push towards uh, having quotas and increasing the numbers, uh, you know, every year by a certain percentage, etc. On one hand, I, I am against the quota principle, but on the other hand, I feel like 
we almost ran out of options. We need a quota in order to start increasing the numbers because we cannot have one and two women change all the cultures that exist. You are right. We will need one and two and three and four until there's a minimum of the 30% of, uh, and above women represented. We cannot really say that women will be able to start changing those attitudes and the culture that exists out there. Dina, I just wanted to yes. also add to your comments. Um, uh, when I was running for election, I did some visits to different parliaments and I was invited to visit the parliament uh, in Scotland because they have, a, they have adopted a system where it's supposed to create a life, uh, life home balance because they want to encourage women uh, politicians in politics and decision-making at the mm -hmm. higher level. So what they actually did was change the working environment and they changed the working hours and they um, created a more, let's say, um, balanced uh, opportunity so that women could go away and be mothers as well. They wouldn't have to sacrifice and work grueling hours in comparison to British a parliament where they still have, you know, these issues. So, um, and of course, you you um, brought the, situ the the example of Finland. So they are a, a lot more, let's say, progressive. And I think Scan Scandinavia in um, in general, they they seem to embrace the fact that we need to allow for the work life balance, and Absolutely. even men need the work life balance. And you know, I think this is the perfect timing to start putting the, the issue of work by life balance on the table more often because, you know, as much as we need it as mothers, also men need it. And maybe in the past when the jobs were not cognitive jobs and the jobs were mainly, you have to go to the field and you have to like spend hours uh, in agriculture or uh, with the an herding animals or trying to catch uh, prey, etc. Of course, you needed more time away to do that and to work uh, I don't know how many hours. But today, if we look from an organizational behavior perspective, we know for a fact that the number of hours is not the determinant of productivity. The number you could, you know, and we know as women also, especially us uh, with the women who have kids and who sometimes have like three hours at the office and then they have to go back home. Those three hours could be equal to an eight hour day. You know, those three hours, you go in, tack, 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 and the, the, the energy, where it comes and how it comes, I, I have no idea how it is channeled, but eventually you end up being much more productive in three hours than in eight. And, and this is why also if you look at uh, uh, models around the world, they are moving towards shorter working time at uh, um at, at work, because eventually we know that if I spend less time at work, we're not saying like spend one, one day and the rest is holiday, but you know, less time doesn't mean less productivity. In fact, it means more time to re-energize and recharge and clear your head and do the things that you are naturally uh, uh, born to do, to spend time with your loved ones and your family and so on, and then go back to work and produce and, and be efficient there. And there's a lot to be learned also from, you know, the COVID-19 experience and the time that we ended up spending at home. There are positives and negatives in that, but there's a lot to be learned also about productivity because the world continued eventually. So I want to go back to, um, to this slide here. I was doing some research yesterday and I found, I decided to look at the number of, uh, because I know that you have chemistry as a major uh, science in, uh, uh, at Kaos. I thought, let me look at the, you know, Nobel Prize winners uh, uh, of chemistry. And it's scary. I want to read every single woman's name here because she's a hero. Marie Curie, Irene Joliot Curie, uh, Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, uh, Ada Jonas, uh, Frances Arnold, Emmanuel Charpentier, Jennifer Doudna, and we want more. And, and if you look at all of this list, there's three from 2018 until now. So now these are tipping the balance, really. The percentage is so small. But why is that? Is it, as you were saying earlier, that, that women are not smart enough? No, it's not a biological reason. It is a social issue. It is how we have been socialized and the uh, social structures uh, that we have created at home, at work, at university, and so on, that are playing a role in this. 
Of course, now we have initiatives such as L'Oreal and many others that are being created that are making a change, but still, we need more of that and this reality needs to change because this does not reflect whether women are capable of coming up with, uh, uh, you know, um, producing at the same level uh, uh, as men. So barriers are oftentimes subtle. Barriers are not always in your face type of barriers. Oh, we're running out of time. Um, sometimes they are hard to see. One of the, the very famous uh, uh, barriers that we see is the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling is like almost, you cannot see it, but some women, many women find themselves unable to climb up uh, uh, at work anymore. And why is that? Most of the time it's because um, either they went for a year maternity and came back and they, they lagged behind, or there are no policies that are inclusive policies that are specifically designed to ensure that everyone's treated equally and meritocracy uh, uh, shines through. But that's not the only, uh, the only one. There's another, oh, actually, I wanted to also show you that about the glass ceiling. There's a study that showed that, um, you know, some interpersonal issue, organizational gender culture, uh, situational issues, etc. they end up lead, leading to differential treatment between men and women, which ends up leading to uh, um, glass ceiling, which end, uh, ends up also impacting work life, uh, uh, creating work life conflict, and then creating this feeling in women, like one of the, uh, the ladies who commented earlier, that, you know, when you feel you're underappreciated, you want to leave. It creates the intention to quit. You are strained uh, at work. Uh, you are not engaged anymore. You are not satisfied at work. And all of these reasons are very good reasons for us to leave work and not to stay in it. Another this I showed you. Another uh, uh, big problem is the leaky pipeline. And look at the leaky pipeline. And this is from data from the US. These are uh, ninth graders. There's 4 million uh, ninth graders. Uh, these are females uh, in 2001. By the time they reached high school, uh, high school graduates, they're 2.8. Uh, went to uh, you know college plans, that was 1.9. College ready 1.3, majoring in STEM 278,000. And this is in between 2009 and 2011. So the pipeline is leaking throughout from school all the way until you reach university. And the, the option of choosing STEM fields, you are already out because you have been socialized into that. But in the Arab world, there's something else that. Um, um, uh, Charlotte Karam and Fida Afyuni identified or coined this term called the bursting pipeline. And the bursting pipeline is that it's not only at university or, or at work, you go in and then you start leaving work because of family and whatever. It's actually before even going into the workplace, you are not even able to penetrate the workforce because discrimination happens at the recruitment level. Why would I hire a girl with the, uh, in chemistry or biology, etc., if the uh, the boy or the uh, you know a woman, uh, if the man is uh, you know will not leave me in a few years and will not be distracted by his family and all of that. So this is a major problem that we are facing and that is, you know, hindering women who are qualified, highly capable from even entering the workplace to begin with. Uh, some other realities is that women uh, are more likely to get lower initial offers and uh, women get promoted on performance, whereas men get promoted on potential. And actually it reminded me of uh, something that I heard in a talk yesterday. Someone was saying that uh, usually feedback even when it's given to a woman, the same feedback you give to a woman, you it's much more softer than the feedback that is given to a man at work. I'm, I'm saying not necessarily at university. Why? Because the expectations, you know, first, you know, the, you, the woman is perceived as a very sensitive uh, human being, so we don't want to hurt that person. But also because you expect that the man will excel and succeed and go to leadership positions. So you want to give them more feedback so that they could move forward. So women end up being disadvantaged from these practices, which oftentimes lead to the glass ceiling effect as well, eventually. But regarding the job offers, let's see. How many of you, if I can see a raise of hand, how many of you believe that women are not good negotiators? I can't see very well. I can see so from- I can say, 
the two half of the room is thinking that women are not good negotiator. Okay. The All two right. Third and, of the room. The two third. Two third. And uh, and also from uh, uh, Solkem, would you like to say something, or you're raising, you're adding your hand to the. No, no, I'm raising my hand to say that I think uh, women are not good negotiators, unfortunately. Why do you think that, since you're chatting with us? Um, I think uh, when a woman negotiates, she actually bursts stereotypes and negotiation coming from a woman is perceived as aggression, uh, whereas uh, for men it's expected. That's beautiful. And actually, there was um, a study by Schneider in 2017, where um, when, when women knew or were told that, that this notion that women cannot negotiate uh, well on their, uh, on their own behalf is actually a false notion and that women are capable, they tended in the rest of the experiment to actually <laughs> do much better in, in negotiation because a lot of it is also what has been impl implement you know uh, imprinted in your um, in our brains but sometimes and actually I am one of those people who got offered a very different offer than um, than my male colleague who has equal qualifications as me when I started but then I realized when we had that because we were friends and a few years down the like a few months down the line we had this chat and we we spoke money because usually the issue of money never, you know, you don't talk about it. Uh, and I realized that we had different offers. But then the other thing that I realized is that he did get the same offer as me at the beginning, but then he just pushed back. He just said, oh, can you, um, can you make a better offer? And I didn't. But then when I knew that, and I removed the idea from my head that it's not me that I'm not good uh, as good and I'm not perceived as I'm, I'm not going to put this behind me. And I went in and I said, I did not negotiate. Now I am negotiating. This is what I did. This is how I proved myself this year. If you believe in me, I need to be equally treated. It took two weeks until my salary was adjusted. Male researchers, vague language, more likely to win grants. Another difference between men and women is not necessarily uh, men are better at getting grants or than women, but the use of language that is sometimes used is actually favoring men over women. And this kind of, if you, if you go down to uh, a research that looks at why do men perform better, oftentimes you, you find that it's not a matter of performance, it's either language, uh, training, etc., something like this. Um, women are less likely to have access to senior leaders, as uh, many of you had uh, mentioned uh, before, because senior leaders tend to be more men. And if the man is going to go play golf, as you said earlier, like the Hadid, or, I don't know, have a coffee, the likelihood is it's going to be with another uh, male colleague, not with a woman colleague. But what is the problem is that a lot of the, those critical conversations about work happen when you're at your most relaxed. When you're in your uh, comfortable and I'm having a cup of coffee, I can share an idea with someone. So women end up, men end up being uh, exposed or having access more to senior leaders and having access to information about what's happening in the organization than, uh, uh, than men. The maternal wall, many of you have referred to this. Um, you, can't, you just can't win when they call uh, women who work part time as lazy, uh, while also telling you your kids are growing up without uh, a mother if you work full time. So you end up living with guilt, whether you do this or you don't, whether you work or you don't. And it's time to start standing by each other and leaning on each other and realizing that this is, you know, uh, uh, societal pressures that are only adding to our um, to our misfortune and not allowing us to progress and continue uh, uh, to push forward at work. And in fact, this is uh, something that I wanted to put out there for uh, the working women uh, in the room. There are studies that show that kids of working women grow into happy adults and happier adults. And even there is mounting evidence uh, that ch children of uh, working mothers even are more empathetic than other children. So there are even advantages of that. And I have to say, I, I, you know, uh, being a working mom, especially after I moved to Finland and I have less help with my family not being around, um, you know, my kids now, they do a lot of the duties at home also together collectively with, uh, with me and their dad. 
they do, you know, uh, the, the dishwasher, they do, and, and they feel like now, for example, they're there in the background, you don't hear them because they know that mommy has a very important uh, meeting and she needs to be talking to, uh, to her colleagues and that they cannot uh, disrupt. So they end up developing high levels of empathy and understanding at quite a young age as well. I'm gonna um, move to another question. Women are less confident than men. Who agrees? Show of hands. So I would say a third of the room, between a third and half of the room agrees with this statement. Great, I am so happy to hear. So, um, Unfortunately, as also, uh, I think it was Sol Kim who was saying earlier, um, stereotypes push women to behave in uh, uh, gender normative manners in a way that uh, doesn't counter what people have in their minds about women. So, for example, if a girl becomes, you know, shows confidence or like talks proudly about her work, she ends up being perceived as like, uh, oh, she's so arrogant. But a man could be, I don't know, uh, they lift the glass and then they could go tell everyone about how they lifted this glass so masterfully and start teaching others about how they've done it. I know I am being sarcastic and I apologize for the men who are listening. <laughs> it's not for every man, but it is a reality that hits women more than men. Um, and it's the backlash effect. You see someone uh, who is very assertive, a man who is very assertive, you think like, oh, wow, amazing, uh, you know, acting like a true leader. You see a woman who is acting assertive, unfortunately, it is understood as, you know, she's too bossy, uh, she's the queen bee, and you start having all those labels that, that uh, come about. And that's what we call the backlash effect. So the backlash is when someone behaves in a manner that is, uh, um, counter the norm that people have in their minds and the ideas that they have in their minds. Um, what's behind the pay gap in, in STEM? Women are paid less than men uh, for entry-level positions and, uh, and it has nothing to do with skill set. Unfortunately, it's all a matter of uh, uh, structures that have been built unfairly and things that how we have been trained to kind of uh, um, act along. For example, the not negotiating and so on will lead to us not being uh, uh, paid the same or organizations allowing themselves to treat people differently for the same positions. I cannot put the blame on the, on the victim here also because it's not women who are only to blame, it's also organizations and societies as a whole who can pray, play a role in making this change. And uh, I was very interested, Nadia, when you mentioned the book, the, what was it called, the, the book that you mentioned? The, the Female Brain. I would like to read that. This is also a similar book by also a neuroscience uh, uh, professor. Um, her name is uh, Gina Rippon, and it dissects all the, she brings in all the research that supports what is, has been gendered in the female brain to show at the end of the day, the conclusion is that men and women are not different biologically in terms of like intelligence and capabilities. That's not the issue. And a lot of these things are actually uh, uh, fallacies that how we've been uh, socially accustomed to, uh, to accept. So context instead of biology, creates or erases gender differences. Context, not biology, is what creates and, uh, and erases gender differences. So now I'm gonna uh, move to the very end because I know I realize that we've way over time. I'm gonna go straight to, you know, the conclusion of this is that there are gender stereotypes and we need to break that bias. And this is a hashtag that's being uh, used now on International Women's Day, breaking that bias, breaking those gender stereotypes, because we cannot keep on not being ourselves just because we want to act in a, uh, in a normative way that makes us more, more accepted. The professional environment are predominantly masculine, and this needs to change because women bring in a lot of uh, uh, amazing things to the workplace, and they have the capability of transforming work, work cultures. And we need more female role models. We need more platforms for women to speak. We need more role models to be show, showcased left, right, and center. And this 
in 20 and 30 years time, we will feel it and we will see it in the numbers of graduates in our universities as well. Final three recommendations for um, um, uh, building your own personal brand. Intention is not the same as perception. If you intend to act in a way that is kind, it's not always perceived kind. Uh, <clears throat> What you have control over is how people perceive you. You do have control over that. And your personal brand is what lies in between. How others see you, who you are, what lies in between is what you can actually shape. So you can play a big role in shaping how people consider you and believe you. And today is the time for us to start really thinking about showcasing our professionalism, showcasing our confidence, our negotiation skills, and our conflict resolution skills that we tend to do very often. Than men. It's time for us to start self-strategizing, to start thinking, what is the image I want people to uh, think of me? What is my mission in life, my personal mission? What are my, my personal values? What, uh, what is my vision for myself? And then all of these things is actually brand you, brand me. And then I could start strategizing to create this perception in the, in the minds and the eyes of people around me at work. Second, friendship network, genetic interaction network, protein-protein interaction network, transportation network, they exist in all shapes and forms. But what's most important is your social network. Build more meaningful networks. Every single day, every single event you go to, every single class you teach, every single class you attend, every single meeting you go to, it's okay. Even if you don't know anyone and it's going to take a little bit of extra effort, start building that network. Reach out. Reach out to other women. Reach out to other men. Reach out to other people and grow this network because this is the only thing that's going to start breaking this boys club that we referred to earlier and that you uh, and, and will create for you a wider arena that you can play in. My final uh, recommendation is the imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome exists everywhere. And I'm not sure if I'm, you know, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the term, but this is the imposter syndrome is when you think that what you know um, everyone knows, and it's so obvious. Actually, every PhD student goes through the imposter syndrome at some point in their career because you become so immersed and knowledgeable about something that you think it's so obvious and everyone knows it, where in fact, what you know is actually huge and massive. So don't let that imposter syndrome come in your way and hinder you. Don't be, don't shy away. Promote yourself, self-promote and talk about your achievements. It's time for us to be proud about all the advances and amazing things that we are doing. Thank you again for listening and I apologize for running over time. I try to keep as short as possible. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Lina. That was great. Thank you so much. So I'm, I'm really sorry, we don't have, really don't have time for questions because we are running really super late. Uh, we will have the contact information of uh, uh, Lina. So if you want to ask her a question, we will uh, provide her email address and then you can contact her directly. So thank you so much. I would like to give the floor to Susanna Nunes uh, for the concluding remarks. Um, thank you all for attending. And before uh, the final remarks, I also would like to thank all the support that we got from uh, Scouts in general, from the CCRC. Uh, so from uh, all the part of the CCRC, I would like to thank special thanks to Amani, to Rahina, to Ling, to Shirin. And, okay, we are forget. And to... I, I, okay, we, there are five, it's okay. Alia, sure, absolutely, Alia, I, I didn't see her. So thank you so much to these five great ladies uh, to helping us in uh, um, putting together this event. So a, a round of applause for them.